really need to swatch? And if so, how big does it really have to be? Today we're going to answer your swatching questions. junkies welcome back to the color cauldron i'm johanna the owner and dyer behind potion yarns and host of this podcast today we are going to answer some questions that i have been getting recently about swatching if you're a knitter or crocheter with even a tiny bit of experience most likely you have come across the dreaded word swatching maybe it's not a dreaded word to you some people are actually lucky enough that they enjoy the swatching process they're patient enough precise enough um, calm enough, whatever it is, they're just into the whole process and they enjoy the swatching process and kudos to them, good for them. I wish I could be more like that, but I believe that I fall into what is probably a more populated category of crafters who really would like to just skip that dreaded swatch and get right to their project. Today we're going to talk about some tips for swatching, uh, what you absolutely need to do, some things that you can kind of cheat on and skip or um, other other areas that you can maybe hasten that process a little bit but I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit first about what swatching is and why it's important so if you're not familiar swatching which is also called a tension swatch or a tension um, or, or a gauge swatch uh, I've heard it referred to as a tension swatch a gauge swatch or just swatching in general uh, from various different patterns and books so whatever you call it basically it's like a practice it's knitting or crocheting up a little sample shape, usually a square or a rectangle, um, but some kind of a sample shape of your project. So if you're going to be knitting a sweater, you're going to knit a little square or rectangle first that is going to be like a mini version um, without all the shaping and sleeves and all of that. It's just a little bit of knitting or crochet in order to help you figure out um, how tight or how loosely you are crafting, to figure out what needle or hook size you need to use, how much yarn it's gonna take, etc., etc. There are lots of reasons why you would want to swatch. And the most common reason is because you have a pattern to make something, let's say it's a sweater, and you want it to come out as close as possible to the original, right? And the designer has taken all of the time and effort to leave you exact stitch counts and row repeats and how many times you need to do X, Y, Z. And in order for that to actually work and for your sweater to come out looking even remotely like the picture and also somehow fit you, you have to make sure that you are knitting at approximately the same gauge as the person who designed the sweater. Because if you aren't, your sweater could end up being way too small or way too big or some awkward combination where it's way too small in the sleeves but way too huge in the body, right? Uh, we've all had at least one of these moments where something did not fit the way we anticipated, where something just didn't look right. Or another reason that you may want to swatch um, besides sizing is like, let's say that you're going to be doing some color work, some stranded knitting or crocheting with multiple colors, and you choose different colors than the yarns that were used in the pattern in order to make sure that yours come out looking as good as the original sample swatch from the pattern, you're going to want to make sure that you swatch them first and see if the colors actually look good together or if they look really terrible. I can't tell you the number of times I've picked out colors that technically looked beautiful next to each other when they're just hanked up in different skeins, but then as soon as I started knitting with them, my stranded motifs were too small and there wasn't enough contrast between the yarns and they turned out the, the whole design got lost. It just looked, it looked like a jumble of colors instead of actually like little pictures in the, in the knitting. So that's another reason you might want to swatch, to check for color and contrast matching, to check for um, sizing issues. And another reason that you might want to swatch is because you're trying out a different stitch pattern or you're making some adjustments to an existing stitch pattern. So if you're not exactly following the pattern the way it is, like let's say that they have a big wide cable flanked by two skinny cables and you like it but you want to make two smaller cables in the middle that are separated by a single cable and cables on the outside right but you want to make sure it looks good in that yarn and with the other stitch patterns you're going to need to swatch that to make sure that everything works out okay before you just jump in and commit to an entire sweater Another reason you might want to do it is if you're substituting yarns and like let's say that you're knitting a shawl and it calls for two skeins that are 438 yards each 
and you have two skeins that are 400 yards each, do you really need that extra like 70 some yards for the pattern or is that just extra? You might need to swatch and see how much um, yarn you're using up within your gauge swatch to get an idea of if you're going to have enough to complete the entire pattern or if you're gonna to need to make adjustments or buy a third skein. So those are all reasons why you might want to swatch. So let's actually talk about what, how big is the swatch? What is it exactly? What do you need to do to actually make one? The huge majority of patterns out there are going to ask you to knit a gauge swatch that is at least four inches by four inches. So it's ideally going to be a square, four inches wide and four inches tall. However, most gauge from patterns are set across four inches. So to actually measure your gauge swatch, I have one here I'll show you. To actually measure a gauge swatch, I want to make sure that I'm measuring the middle of the gauge swatch. So I wanna measure in here. I don't wanna measure on the edges. The reason you don't want to go right to the edge of your gauge swatch and take that into account when counting stitches for your gauge, you're not going to want the edges to curl. You are going to wanna to make sure that it lays perfectly flat and it isn't curving or curling or bunched up at all. So you don't actually want to measure right on the gauge swatch. So like, let's say you want to make sure you get the full four inches in stockinette and it tells you, let's say your pattern says that there are 20 stitches to four inches. So you would want to make sure that in addition to casting on the 20 stitches that you're hoping and planning to get in your four inches, you would also want to make sure that you had at least a couple edge stitches. I usually do at least three to four on each edge. So if I did four edge stitches each side, that'd be an extra eight plus my 20. So I would actually need 28 stitches. So always make sure you're measuring the middle of the swatch. Same kind of a thing when it comes to row gauge. So what is row gauge? If we're measuring on our swatch, if we measure horizontally across, and you see all those little stitches because I'm knitting back and forth horizontally, all of those horizontal stitches that we're counting, that is going to be your stitch count on your gauge. Then we're going to turn the tape measure sideways and count up the rows, and that is going to be your row gauge. So row gauge goes vertically, stitch gauge goes horizontally, and that is how you are going to measure your swatch. If you are working with a, a, an interesting stitch pattern, let's say, like cables or lace, you are going to need to take into account the motif of your cable. We'll talk a little bit more about this when I'm showing you how I measure my swatch in just a moment, but I like to make sure that I take a full repeat of a cable or lace chart um, because most of them are going to have some kind of a repeat or um, like this one is for a sweater where there's just one big wide panel up the back set in a field of stockinette. There's a big wide panel that goes right up the back of your spine in this cardigan that is this cable panel. And this is as wide as it is in the pattern. So I just did one full repeat of the chart for my gauge swatch so that I could make sure that I was getting the entire motif in about the same amount of stitches as they are and the same with the row. So once you've decided how many stitches you actually need to cast on to get your four by four inches and you've cast on, then what do you do? My best tip for knitting a gauge swatch is to start with, if you're knitting back and forth in rows, start with a couple of rows at least. So at least two, I like to even go four rows of garter stitch. Just knit every row back and forth for two to four rows. That's going to make sure that your edge doesn't curl and gives you a nice, firm, solid um, row to kind of set everything off. I like to make sure that I include garter stitch edging. At least three stitches on each side, three to four, on each side are garter stitch, so I knit every row. And then I have my stockinette or my motif in the middle, and that is how I make sure that my edges don't curl. It's much easier for me to lay it flat and measure it. Here's the most important thing you need to remember when you go to actually measure your swatch. Once you've knitted it all up and you need to actually measure it, the most important thing to remember is that you want it to lay flat. So as much as it is fun to just cast right on in your project, knit your gauge swatch as small as possible, um, don't spread it out on your knee like so and then try to measure just an inch or so. That's not really not going to work out best. If at all possible, if like if you're on a plane or something, at least get a magazine or a book or your little fold out tray, put it on that so that you can lay it flat as much as possible. If you have any kind of like flat surface, like a laptop 
or the fold out tray or a book. The other thing is you want to make sure that your swatch is 100% dry when you go to measure it. If you are going to block your finished project, like let's say it's a lace project, Almost all lace is going to need to be blocked at least a little bit, if not fairly aggressively. So whatever you're going to do to your finished project, you need to do that to your swatch. If it's a lace shawl and you're going to have to block it pretty aggressively and stretch it pretty hard to open up the lace and show off the motif, then you need to do that same kind of vigorous blocking to your swatch. If it's a little garter stitch cardigan and it's just super, super simple, all garter stitch, and you don't really need to worry about blocking anything because you knit it in the round, um, then you don't need to block your swatch. So always take into account how you're going to treat your finished object. If you're not going to block the finished object, you don't need to block your swatch. If you're going to block it extremely lightly, then just block your swatch extremely lightly. Do a quick little steam block or something like that. If you're going to uh, have to block it aggressively, you have to block your swatch aggressively. Now there is another trick that someone has given me. I have never personally done this, but um, it sounds like a good idea. I have actually heard of knitters who once they finish their swatch, they will um, cast it off or put it on waist yarn or something, and um, they will wash it, do whatever they're gonna do to their finished object, whether laying it flat or hanging it up or whatever they're gonna do, and then they will take it with them in their purse or hang it up on a hanger and just let it hang especially if it's like a garment that's going to hang from your shoulders, like a cardigan or something, they'll let it hang for a few days to a week just to see if it stretches out anymore, how it does with wear and tear, like getting in and out of their purse and or being in their pocket all week long. Um, some people really think that this helps you determine the sturdiness, the hardiness of the yarn, and whether or not it's going to grow. I would say the most important time to do that is when you are working with a fiber that is known for growing, i.e. 100% or large amounts of cotton. Cotton always, always, always seems to stretch. It is very, very, very um, stretchy, but it does not bounce back the way wool does. So once it stretches out, it's stretched out. So if you make a, an all cotton cardigan and it's hanging off of your shoulders and it's real heavy, after the first time or two of wearing it, you're gonna find that your waist length cardigan is suddenly becoming like a tunic type sweater dress almost. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you are being careful of that when you make your yarn selection for your projects. But if you're knitting with wool or if you're knitting with like acrylic that bounces back pretty easily, things like that that don't lose their shape, you don't really need to worry about doing that. I've never done it. Phoebe, goodness gracious girl. Somebody likes to play with my swatches. Let's actually take a look at how we measure it. To measure your swatch, you're going to want to make sure that you have it on a flat surface. So I have put out one of my blocking mats on my dining room table so that it's perfectly flat and I'm not trying to balance it over like my knee or something. And uh, you do not have to pin it like I've done here, but it really does help, especially if you have fabric that is curling. You will want to make sure you block your swatch if you are going to block your finished item, however you would treat the finished item when you're done with it, whether you're blocking or um, washing or anything, you will wanna make sure that you do that with your swatch first and wait till it's completely dry. I have not blocked mine actually, but um, it wasn't curling much because I put a nice garter edge on it and um, it was laying pretty flat. So I have just stretched it out dry, but made sure not to pull it apart. So it's not stretched out, it's just laying flat. And I like to use a flexible tape measure, but I have used a ruler before in a pinch, and you can definitely do that if you need to. To measure it, once you have everything planned out, you're gonna want to go for the middle. And most swatches are gonna have you measure over four inches, but you basically just want to make sure that you are not um, measuring on like a curved line. Like don't try to like curve your tape measure. You wanna lay it nice and flat. Pick your spot, and then I'm gonna count here. One, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So I'm getting 20 stitches to four inches. So if we divide that by four, that would be five stitches to the inch in my stockinette section. Now, if you are working over um, a cable panel, it is easiest if you look at your chart and you figure out how long your cable repeat is. Um, so in my chart that I have, um, Mine was um, 38 stitches wide. So it from each garter border, I have 38 stitches in the middle. Um, so, and that is one full cable panel. So I'm actually going to measure across this whole thing 
and I am getting six inches on my entire cable panel. So I would um, divide 38 stitches by six inches because that's what it fits into and that will give me my per inch gauge for the cable panel. Um, now my sweater does have both a stockinette and a cable um, gauge on it so that I can take both of them and compare. Uh, some that have cables or lace or something in it will only give you the stockinette gauge. Sometimes they will have you only measure the cable panel. Whatever your gauge swatch says is what you need to plan out. I hope that that really helped you guys get a feel for how to measure your swatch and give you a little bit more confidence on actually counting stitches and rows. It is a lot harder every time you're working with something that isn't stockinette. For instance, cable panels. Lace panels are the absolute worst. They are not my favorite to swatch for gauge. Um, however, if you can find a repeat in the chart, like let's say it's a six stitch repeat and there's a very, like right in the middle of that six stitches, there's a very distinct like yarn over knit one yarn over that makes a little like easy to find spot. You can just look for that part um, and see how many of those fall in your four stitches. Um, so it can be a little trickier with that, which is why the majority of patterns, even if they're an all over patterned sweater, a lot of times they will have you do a stockinette gauge. And if you get the same stockinette gauge, you're probably going to get pretty close to the same um, lace cables, etc. However, if it's really got a lot of patterning, a lot of patterns will tell you to go ahead and take both stockinette and the patterned. And I think if you're doing a garment that's going to be worn, it's really important that you do go ahead and swatch both as much as possible because your gauge can actually change whether you're knitting stockinette or like a lace panel or cables or whatever. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is if you're going to be knitting your project flat back and forth in rows, you should knit your swatch flat. If however, you're going to be knitting, let's say you're knitting a pullover um, and your sweater is gonna be a pullover type, no buttons or zippers or anything, just a shirt and it's going to be knit in the round in one piece, no sewing. You're going to want to knit your gauge swatch in the round, which means it's only going to be half as wide as it was. Now there's two ways that you can get around this. There's the cheater way and there's the actual really good way. The first way, the cheater way, is let's say you need to knit a four by four inch swatch and you need to knit it in the round because that's what you're going to be doing with your project. You can choose, okay, I need for, let's say it's again the gauge that was 20 stitches to 4 inches. So you know you need at least 20 stitches around. And let's say we're going to add two extra stitches on each side, so an extra four stitches. We want 24 stitches. So you cast on 24 stitches, you join in the round, and you knit it up like this. Then when you go to lay it flat, you're only going to be measuring two inches, not four. This is the cheater way because it means less work up front, and um, you don't have as much width to measure over. You've only got two inches to measure over as opposed to four. I'm not going to tell you it doesn't work, but I am going to tell you because I've done it lots of times and it's most of the time worked out pretty well for me. However, I am going to tell you there's a reason this is the cheater way, not the best way to do it. It really is not the best way. Ideally, if there's any possibility that you can just grind your teeth and force yourself to like cast on the extra stitches, it is so much more worth it to cast on the extra stitches and do the four inches flat, which means that you would need eight inches around. So if you're going for um, 20 stitches is four inches, you'd actually wanna cast on 40 stitches, join it in the round, and then you should be able to measure your four inches across one side. That's ideally best. Why is it better to knit a larger gauge swatch? The answer is because there's more variation over larger pieces. So if you're measuring over four inches, this is why we don't just measure one inch. You can do that, but it's quite likely that you're going to be like a part of a stitch is gonna be right on that one inch marker. Whereas if you go up to four inches and you measure all of the stitches within your four inches, then that really helps you to get a, a bigger picture. It's kind of like taking a larger sampling of something to get a more likely result. Like when they do a medical study, they don't just test three people, right? Because three people doesn't really give us a majority of what's going on. I don't even know if there are specific numbers that they have to have, but it wouldn't surprise me if there are. And I know that the more variety in people that they test, the more widely received these or, or better received this 
scientific studies are because they're testing a broader group of people so they can more accurately say the majority of people experienced these side effects or whatever. Same thing with your gauge swatch. Just the bigger swatch you have, the more likely you are to catch any anomalies or weird things that happen so that you can make sure that you are actually getting gauge and you're not so likely to get off a little bit. Here's the thing about gauge swatches. Let's say that you're going for the pattern that tells you you need 20 stitches to four inches. Let's say that you actually, um, you do the cheater swatch and you only do two inches, right? So you should be getting 10 stitches to two inches. But let's say that you're actually getting like, let's say you're getting six stitches to two inches. That's four stitches off. That's a pretty big difference. Let's say you're only doing eight. So you're only two inches or two stitches off. And you're like, that's close enough. Eight stitches, 10 stitches. Is that really gonna matter? In a two inch swatch, no, it's not gonna make a huge difference. But let's say that your bust is 40 inches around and you're a stitch per inch off. That's gonna make a huge difference when you are, when you have an extra stitch per inch and now you've got 40 inches going around that bust, you have 40 extra stitches. That's gonna turn into a lot of extra width. Your sweater is going to be swimming off of you and you are going to look like you are a little kid playing dress up in mommy's clothes, right? So this is why it's so important to get gauge. If you are off even a fourth of an inch, it's going to really magnify on a larger scale in your finished project. Again, now if you're knitting like a baby sweater and it's really, really teeny tiny, then if you're like a quarter of a stitch off in your uh, stitch count, it's not gonna matter that much in the big scheme of things because the whole sweater is what, six inches or whatever it is? Um, you're not gonna need a ton, but on a larger sweater, on most of your other projects, it is actually going to be a pretty big difference. And anything that you need to have negative ease to fit you really, really tightly, like socks, it's going to make a big difference. Okay, so let's go over some cheater ways that you can make swatching a little bit less miserable. There are several little tips I have for you if you're one of those people like me who's like, I don't wanna swatch, I just want to get right to the thing. The first thing is not so much a tip as just a reminder that will psychologically help you to hopefully think about it differently. If you are used to knitting with nicer yarns, or maybe you're not used to it yet, but you have like one or two very special indie dyed yarns and you've just invested 30 some dollars or $40 in a skein of really fabulous yarn and you wanna knit a project out of it, just think about spending hours of your time and 30 or $40 of your money on this one single skein and you're gonna invest hours and hours knitting something really special and it's going to look terrible or it's not going to fit. Wouldn't you feel upset? I can't tell you the number of times that that kind of thing has happened to me. I've spent a lot of money on a really nice yarn in a sweater quantity to make myself a pullover or a cardigan or something. I knit it all up and it doesn't fit and it looks awful because I either didn't do my swatch or I rushed through it and didn't do all the steps I was supposed to. And I just wasted hours of my time and sometimes wasted some yarn if it's really, really hard to frog like mohair or something that sticks. Sometimes it's just not very easy to get it back out and redo it. So think about that the next time you're tempted to skip your swatch and remind yourself that you really should swatch because it'll save you hours of frustration and taking things out, lots and lots of crying and or cussing and or drinking, whatever it is that you do when you're discouraged and angry at your knitting. It'll save you all that time if you just do your swatch to begin with. It really is insurance in the long run. Okay, if that still hasn't stopped you, let's talk about some ways that you can cheat. First off, Projects that don't require swatching are projects that don't need to fit perfectly. For instance, scarves. I've never swatched a scarf in my entire life because a scarf is just a long swatch that you just keep going on. So if you don't like something, you can just take it out. You can usually tell fairly quickly and fairly early on. You can take it out, redo it, and we don't need to swatch for that, right? The only thing you need to do is as you're knitting, you hold it up or try it on occasionally and see if it's long enough, wide enough, etc. Same kind of a thing for shawls, any type of shawl. A pie shawl, a crescent shawl, a half moon shawl, a triangular shawl, whatever it is, whatever kind of shawl you're doing, a square or rectangle, you don't need to swatch for shawls. The only reason you would need to do that is if you're doing some kind of a stranded shawl or an intarsia shawl and you're not sure that your colors are going to look right together or that you are going to like these colors in that motif, that's the only reason why you might need to swatch. The only other time I could think of might needing to swatch on a shawl is again, if you aren't sure that you have enough yardage because you're substituting yarn and you wanna make sure that your colors 
and or your yardage is going to work, you might want to do a, a swatch then. But I've never swatched for a shawl or a scarf or anything like that that wasn't an exact fit. A hat is another one that you probably don't need to swatch for. The only thing you might need to do, because hats do need to fit, the majority of hats are made in either one size fits all or one of like two or three general sizes will fit most, most people. Like there'll be like a children's size, maybe like baby, older child, woman small, and a man, which is a large. And it's usually like two to four sizes and you just kind of generally go for those. So again, hats you don't usually need to swatch for. Um, and if you do, I generally find that swatching is a waste of time with a hat. I just start on the brim or wherever you're supposed to start the hat, knit for a little ways and then try it on part way or measure it part way and just see and then take it out if it's not adding up to the measurements that I needed it to because honestly, I feel like a swatch is a waste of time with a hat. So those are some things you wouldn't need to swatch for. Another thing you probably don't need to swatch for, but it's like on the fence. Some people will want to, some people won't, is socks. If you have never knit socks before, you might want to go ahead and do a swatch. Um, here's the thing though, you're knitting socks in the round almost always. So unless you have one of those really rare, weird patterns where you knit them flat and seam them, you are probably gonna be knitting in the round. So you need to knit your swatch in the round, which means you need to double the size of your swatch. And for most people's feet, you might as well just cast on the actual sock itself. Start to knit it a little bit, and then when you get a couple inches in, stop and lay it out, measure it, etc. Try it on if it's for you, or try it on the person if you can, um, and that will give you a better idea. The reason you might wanna go ahead and swatch for a sock or stop partway and measure it is because you wanna make sure that you are incorporating the concept of negative ease into your sock patterns so that they will stay up. If you're not familiar with negative ease and how to size for socks, I would recommend that you check out one of my early videos from early on this year. Um, back in like February, March, we were doing a sock series where we talked about all kinds of things on socks. How to knit socks, what you need to know, what kind of needles I like, what kind of patterns I like, techniques for it. Um, and we did talk about how to get your socks to fit, how to measure your foot, what's negative ease, how to incorporate it, etc. So go back and watch that if you need more refreshments on that, but that is one reason why you might wanna swatch for a sock. However, I don't swatch for my socks. I discovered years ago because I knit so many of them, my first couple pairs were rather rough and didn't fit very well. They were too loose and baggy because I did not know about negative ease. I discovered negative ease, I found a sock pattern that fit really well, I wrote down and memorized the stitch counts that I used to fit my feet about perfectly, and I used that as kind of a general rule for all of my socks now. You can can knit your swatch. I always recommend on circular needles. Um, you can do it on straight needles and still get it to lay nice and flat, but I like to do it on circular needles so that um, I can put it onto the cable and not the needle part and lay it out flat to measure it. Um, so that's one thing. But another thing you can do is I frequently will knit my swatch and then I don't save swatches hardly ever. I do occasionally, but I usually don't cast off my swatch. I just put it onto waste yarn or leave it on a needle as I wash it, block it, let, let it dry, lay it out, etc., And then when I'm completely done measuring it and everything, I'll just unravel the whole thing. That way I save yarn and I'm not wasting anything. And then I can cast on my project with this yarn, even though I used it to swatch. That is one of my little tricks for uh, swatching. It's especially good if you're nervous about running out of yarn. Do not waste your yarn on a swatch. Still do your swatch, but don't cut it, cast off, etc. Just measure it while still on the needles or put it on waste yarn and measure it and then unravel it and reuse that yarn for your project. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you take the time to do your swatch ahead of time, make sure you're blocking it and make sure you're measuring it. There's absolutely no reason why you can't just unravel that and use that. I do it all the time. That's one of my favorite things to do. Sometimes you will want to save your swatches, either just as, I know some people save their swatches in like a little notebook or a box of like knitting memories. They'll keep notes about their sweaters with their swatch next to it so that they can see the yarn they use, the color, they'll keep the ball band in there. That is awesome. If you are that organized and amazing, kudos to you and will you come do mine? Because I am not. I never do that. Um, I don't keep that detailed of notes. I'm terrible about even putting projects in on Ravelry. So if we're friends on Ravelry and you go visit my Ravelry page, I use Ravelry mostly to look up and purchase patterns and then the occasional like joining in a knit along or something in groups. I am really bad about the social aspect and I am terrible, terrible about, I don't have my stash on there. I don't list my projects very often. I'm trying to get better about it so you can see my actual projects and photos and notes because I do adjust a lot of my patterns to fit me specifically. I'm trying to get better about tracking all of my progress on patterns in my Ravelry projects list, but I'm terrible about it. 
So I'm not one of those people that keeps my swatches, but it would be really cool if you were actually good enough to um, cast all this off and knit like good size large swatches. It would be really cool to like make a sampler blanket where you stitch all your swatches together at the end or like scarves or something or even just, you know, make a wall hanging for artwork purposes. It could be a really, really cool way to do it. Okay, so I hope that that has given you a couple of really good ideas on how to like cheat a little bit. Um, another one of my cheating techniques is I do not block all of my swatches. I do block anything that needs blocking. Any project that I know I'm going to need to block, I block the swatch as well. Um, however, a lot of my cardigans do not end up needing to be blocked because if they don't have any like lace or anything and I'm using a pretty bouncy yarn that doesn't crinkle a lot or show a lot of um, like wear or anything like that, I oftentimes won't. So like this is my bombshell worsted, which is in my shop. It's just a super wash, 100% super wash merino worsted weight yarn. It's super bouncy, it's super fabulous, it's wonderful for sweaters, and I'm using it for a big, like grandpa style cardigan that I'm going to be casting on with this color and this yarn. So this is my swatch for that project. It's called I Am Groot. I showed it on the podcast months ago and said I was going to cast it on, and then the speckled yarn I picked out for it was way too busy. So I ended up choosing a different project, and this pattern just went back into my stash of patterns that I want to knit someday. And I recently decided it was time to pull this out and actually knit it. So I've chosen one of my hand dyed yarns for it and I knit a swatch. I did not block my swatch because this yarn is very, very bouncy and it has, um, I grounded it with garter stitch on all sides so that it didn't curl or roll. And it also has this really great cable pattern or cable panel with a pearl background on the bottom. So I started with the cable section and then I did a little garter stitch stripe here and then did my stockinette section above so that I could get both gauges measured. And this cable panel really grounds it so I don't need to block it as well. And looking at the way the sweater is constructed, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to need to, like I'm not going to need to block the sweater. I will wash it of course after I wear it and stuff, but I don't think I need to like stretch anything in the blocking. Um, in fact, my goal is going to be to not stretch it at all when I wash it because it isn't going to need it based on the stitch patterns and the construction of the sweater. So that's another way you can cheat. You don't always have to block your swatch. Okay, so let's talk about what to do if your gauge swatch is off. Because this is the most common thing is people are like, I did the gauge swatch and it didn't work. <laughs> so let's say that your pattern says you need to have 20 stitches to four inches in stockinette stitch. And they tell you to use a size six needle, say. Let's say that you grab your size six, you knit up your swatch, you do exactly what you're supposed to do, follow all of the tips I give you in this video and everything you find online and your gauge swatch is actually 22 stitches to four inches. So you have two extra stitches in there, right? What do you do? Or maybe it's under, what if it's only 14 stitches instead of 20 or 16? What are you gonna do? So you need to keep in mind that the easiest thing to do is just to change your needle size, but that's going to require you to knit a new gauge swatch. So there are two options here. You can either change your needle size or you can adjust your stitch count. Sometimes I like to just, if I like how the fabric looks the way it is, I will just adjust my numbers. This happened to me um, actually recently. I knit a gauge swatch on a size two needle for a little vintage style sweater. My gauge was significantly off and um, I knit a gauge swatch in a size four needle to see if I could get it closer. And I did get it closer, but it was still off and I looked at the size four fabric and it was very loose. And I was like, with the yarn that I chose that has a very high silk content and very drapey and has got a lot of texture to it, it looked terrible when it was all like loose and whatever. I really liked the size two fabric much better because it was tighter. It held that drapey silk yarn in a little bit more, gave it more structure. I much preferred the tighter gauge than the loose drapey four size four gauge. So I decided to jigger my numbers and go with the size two that I originally knit my gauge swatch with and just do all of the math differently. So I wrote down what my gauge was on a size two and then every time it would tell me like cast on so many stitches, I would check my numbers with my actual gauge on the size two and then I'd go up or down as needed to make the sweater fit to my gauge size. And that way I'm much happier with the finished result. If I had knitted on the size four, it would have been very, very loose of a fabric instead of really nice, nice and tight and elastic. Um, and the way it's knit, uh, it's a vintage style sweater. So you knit with negative ease so that it really hugs your body and it looks much, much better on the size two. And it feels more elastic to me as well. 
So that's something you need to keep in mind. Is if you like the pattern, the fabric of the swatch the way you have it, even if your numbers are off, it's really a better choice to just change the numbers and do some math. And there's plenty of resources out there. This is not the video for that. We'll go over that more later. But change the math and um, go with the needle that you like the results of. But let's say that you're not married to this, the results of what you did. You're like, okay, the size six was fine, but I'd really rather not have to do all the math. You are going to need to either go up or down depending on how many stitches you have. So let's say that you actually got 16 stitches instead of 20 to your four inches on your size six needle. If you need to get to the 20 stitches per four inches, then you need to change your needle size. If you have fewer stitches, that means that your stitches are bigger, right? You're getting only four stitches to the inch instead of five stitches to the inch because you're, you're think of it as like your stitches are too fat. They've got their arms out like this, so nobody's getting by their little elbows and you need them to put their elbows in and get skinnier, right? So if that's the case, if your stitches are too big, you're going to need to go down a needle size or even two. So if you are at a size six, you'd wanna try a five or even a four for your next swatch and see if you can get more stitches in your gauge swatch that way. Let's say you have the opposite problem. Let's say you got 22 stitches and your stitches are, are just too skinny, so you're getting more stitches in your gauge swatch. If your stitches are too skinny, you have more than the number you need, you need to go up a needle size because you need to get your stitches to fluff up a little bit and stick their elbows out so they're a little bit fatter, right? So you need a bigger needle. So if you were working on a size six, you'd wanna go up to at least a seven, if not an eight. So hopefully that will help you guys when you're doing your swatches. I hope that took some of the misery out of it. Sometimes if we just understand the why behind what we're doing, that's enough for us to break down resistance right then and be like, okay, there is a good reason for this. I'm not just doing this because some asinine, mean party pooper designer forced me to do it because that's what everybody says to do. It's not like that. When you finally understand what's going on and you realize that you have control over it, it can actually be kind of fun to swatch. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, I still don't like it. I will say I had a lot of fun doing this one because it's worsted weight and I typically knit with more fingering weights. And so it went really fast. I just turned on um, some YouTube videos that I wanted to listen to. I was listening to a podcast on YouTube, where, one where I could mostly listen, and I just sat there and knit my swatch while I was watching my podcast, and it was great. So try to do something fun that you like. That is uh, the other thing that I have for our swatching video before we finish off for today, is some other little tips to hopefully make it more fun. First of all, do something you like while you're doing it. So watch, uh, watch some Netflix or watch something on YouTube. Listen to a podcast or an audiobook that you are really excited about. Um, do it while you're chatting with friends and just like talking about something fun. If you are the kind of person where you can, if you're just doing a stockinette swatch and you can read while you're swatching, um, like I do, I often will do my stockinette swatches while I'm reading a book and that helps me to feel like I'm not just wasting my time and it goes by pretty quickly and I don't mind it as much. Um, it's also a good thing to take on like plane rides or something like that. Just keep in mind that if you're actually measuring your swatch, you want to uh, wait until you can block it if you are going to need to block it and you want to make sure you have a flat surface to measure, but it can be a good thing on a plane ride or on the train or a bus. Um, it's, a, it's just a good thing to do when you have something else going on so that you don't just sit there feeling grumpy and bored. Um, and the other thing is remind yourself that at the end of it, you get a sweater that really, really fits. You can also try uh, bribing yourself with little things like every four rows that I finish, I get to eat a bite of chocolate or I get an M&M or whatever it is. Um, you can try something like that. Sometimes bribing yourself really does help. I will often do things like if I sit down and I do my swatch for this and I finish the swatch right now while it's um, blocking, then I get to go cast on something that doesn't require a swatch at all, like a, a shawl or something that I've really been wanting to do, or a new pair of socks since I know what size I need to cast on my socks or something like that. Um, or I'll go, you know, if I finish this swatch, then I get to go to Half Price Books and buy myself a new knitting book or something like that. <laughs> um, so bribe yourself if necessary. It can work and why not? Then at the end you get a sweater that fits and you actually did your swatch. So I, I'm not above bribing myself to make things happen. Okay, I hope that took some of the misery out of it for you. Happy swatching. Um, please leave me a comment below if you have any additional questions. I'll do my best to answer them. 
I really am not the knitting guru who knows everything under the sun. I really am not. But I do enjoy studying and learning and I use as much from my own experience as I can. And then whenever you guys ask questions, if there's something I don't know, I do my best to go up and look, look it up, ask other people, get input. And I love that um, if you guys leave a comment on here and you have a question, sometimes another person commenting will see your question and they'll know the answer even if I don't. And they will give input as well. So I love to get everybody's input helping me to expand the education and um, fun community spirit that we have here among us fiber junkies. So thank you guys for contributing. Give this video a like and don't forget to share it with your friends. If you haven't already, tap the subscription bar um, and make sure that you hit the bell and turn on the notifications because if you just subscribe, don't click the bell. It's not going to tell you when the new videos come up. So you need to click that bell in order to still get notifications every time there's a new video. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Happy swatching and it is now time to cast off. Love you.